welcome. Week nine, it's happening. Hooray. Uh, I have some elegant but uh, very mean, an elegant but very mean bird for you. Uh, today, these are a pair of snowy egrets, and this one has decided this egret was too close and needs to go away, and so it chases it and runs after it. I mean, you would you would nope out of there if this thing was uh, was charging at you. Still chasing this thing, uh, uh, just being uh, as big of a bully as it can possibly be. That's uh, the reality of, of eager life, I guess. All right, so uh, we'll talk about lab five and any questions you have about uh, the new lab after I uh, finish up with the networking stuff. But uh, any questions about lab four? Uh, you so in, in the file I have the match, there's this struct uh, that asks you to that like that has like team name, name one, ID one, name two, like Yeah, well, we're not using that. You can ignore it. Oh we're not. Okay. Uh, the can driver reality doesn't automatically run the reality function. How should we let you know that we want that for you? Uh so in the comments at the top of the mm.cu submit, you should note that you implemented Realic. Um, there, the list of test cases that will be run is in config.h. So if you just want to have it test automatically, you can edit that or run the Realic traces one at a time. Uh, I note the uh, mDriver Realic does not account for the case where you pass the size of zero. Um, which does not come up in the, the two provided test cases. Um, but if you write your own test case with that, it won't work with that changes to, to M driver. Huh. For any hypothetical site faults that might occur, uh, is there a way that you need to tell you like a more precise kind of why uh, beyond just like site fault, here's the line? Like is there like a... So... Uh, one tool that may give you some more information uh, is called valgrind. So if you run the command valgrind dot slash and driver, it will analyze the memory use and will point out if you're using uninitialized memory or things like that. That may or may not be relevant to the safe fault, but that's one way to get more information. Um, the strategy that I have found most effective is a combination of print heap and check heap. Um, and it's like the, it's often the case that the segmentation fault is occurring sometime after the actual problem that say put the wrong thing in a header and then sometime later that header is used and there's a safe fault. Uh, so check heap kind of goes through all the blocks in the heap, verifies the headers and footers match, that the sizes are all positive. You could add things to that to check the explicit free list if that's what you're working on. Uh, and there's a list of things you might check about the explicit free list in the write-up. But for example, if you put Assert check heap uh, with this double underscore line, which will get filled in by the compiler with whatever line that call is on. Uh, check heap is going to do its thing. Uh, it's going to print out any problems it's fine, and then it's going to return true or false based on whether the heap was valid or not. And assert does nothing if what you give it is true, but will stop the program with an error message if what you give it is false. So if you say put this at the start of every one of your functions and then right before all of the return statements, you will know immediately and you'll be able to narrow it down probably to just a few lines of as soon as some problem at least the check heap can identify occurs. And that can be really helpful in figuring out where that's happening. Fine. So 
with the underscore before line, do we literally put that in Yes. There? Okay, so we're yeah. not supposed to, okay. This will get automatically filled in with the appropriate line, number. Yeah, so you don't have to change all the like hard-coded numbers every time your, your file changes. Uh, where do we put the comment that say we implement the Riala? Uh, so at the top of your mm.c, there should be an extensive comment describing the structure of your heap. Uh, it's the different algorithms or optimizations that you implemented, and in that top comment is where you would note if you implemented Riala. Um, yeah. Other other questions? All right, I want to remind you that you can submit multiple files for this lab. For example, a working implicit free list and an attempt at an explicit free list can earn partial credit. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, other thing to keep in mind uh, is uh, you can use late days on this lab. You cannot use late days on lab five because it's due to the last day of class. All right, let's talk about networking. And I want to start with kind of laying out uh, the concept of a very simple uh, client-server application. And then I'll show you, show you what it looks like in code. Uh, but This very simple application is going to have a client and it's going to send a message to the server and the server is going to send that message back. That's excellent. And so the kind of steps involved here is that first, each is a process and in this example they're going to be running on the same machine two processes and they're going to be communicating via a socket. And server will need to create a socket to listen on. That means a socket that can accept connections from other places, and it will need to listen on a particular port, which I've called E. And so our socket is a file, and so it will be assigned a file descriptor, like any other open file a process works with. So I'll just say file descriptor will be three, and what information identifies a socket? What pair of things? On it? Address and port. Yeah, we have an IP address and a port. And uh, so this socket, uh, because these two processes will be communicating on the same machine, the address they'll use is the local host. And uh, that's typically configured to be 127.0.0.1. It's the local host, it just means the same machine. It kind of directs the connection to the machine that it, it's on. So, so our socket is this local host address in our port P. And our echo, echo server is just sitting in a loop. Uh, uh, kind of waiting for a connection to arrive. Um, and this is referred to as uh, blocking. Basically, this process sort of pauses and isn't going to do anything until it receives some connection. So it's just kind of sitting there blocked, waiting for a connection. Okay. Can you explain that? Uh, so this socket is uh, where sockets are modeled as files. So this socket that the echo server is listening on is opened as a file for this process. And we have 
positive quick trace 0, 1, and 2 for standard in, standard out, standard error. And so if we open another file, let's say it's open our file description. Thank you, Other questions? All right, so then what happens next is our echo client. Predetermined port P. So the server is just going to choose some specific port to listen on. The client's circuit, it also is going to be this IP address, but it also needs a port since every socket has an address and a port. And it's just going to let the kernel assign a random port to this side of the socket because the server doesn't need to know ahead of time what that is. So let's call this some port X that the kernel has assigned to, to that socket when it's open. Why do you have a question? I'm just trying to figure out sort of the difference between a port and a socket. Because does a port have multiple Sockets, or does a socket have multiple ports? Um, <laughs> a socket is the combination of an IP address and a port. Okay. Um, and so for a given address, like, so for a given pair of these, that uniquely identifies a socket. So um, uh, the echo, like, you couldn't have some other process also listening on this exact same combination of port and socket because that is already used by this server. Okay. So uh, if in the first step, like you can only create listening something on on the echo server, mm -hmm. how would the echo client, uh, client know which port is connected? Um, yes, it just, this port needs to be something that's known ahead of time. Uh, so connecting to a website um, over HTTP, which we'll talk about later, that's always port 8. Connecting over SSH, that's always port 22. So we will just set up the echo server to listen on a known port and have the client connect to that same port. And, and why would the, uh, so on the client side, why would the um, socket IP be like this, the, like 127 or other, rather than other? Like, uh, so in this case, both of these processes are on the same machine. And so we're not connecting over the network to some computer across the internet. We're just connecting to another process on the chain, same machine. And so, Machines are typically configured such that this specific IP address or local host just refers to the current machine. So it's a way to connect to uh, a socket, socket that some other process has open on the same machine. Other questions? 
they are in the notes and the book. Um, but there's a few steps where the server opens a socket, uh, reserves it as to listen on, uh, and then it basically it blocks, it pauses, and just waits for a connection to come. All right, so our client has opened up this socket, which will, in the client's process, so also file descriptor three, and it makes a connection here. And when the Echo server receives this connection, <coughs> the server isn't going to uh, try and do all its communication with this listening socket. The purpose of this listening socket is just to uh, uh, receive connections for the first time. And so when it accepts this connection, it's going to do that by opening a second socket, the Axon File Descriptor 4, and then communication between these two. will take place between the client socket and this second socket, the server socket. So once that listening socket has been, it's never using that trigger, it's never using it? Uh, if another client were to connect, it would oh. similarly connect to this listening socket. Yeah, so its purpose is just to sit there, waiting for a connection to come in, and then sort of create a dedicated socket for the two-way communication with that particular client. But in the case of an echo, what's the point of opening up the second socket compared to just like immediately sending a packet back? Uh, no more back and forth. So uh, in the example we'll do, it's sort of too, it's too simple for this to be strictly necessary. But if our server was doing something uh, more complicated, um, and in particular, if we wanted this server to be able to accept connections from multiple clients at the same time, and uh, all sorts of websites want to be able to do this, right? If you log on to Moodle, it needs to be a case that you aren't using 100% of Moodle, and no one else can access it until you log on. Um, and so we'll want to have sort of separate channels for each client and the ability to, ha to have kind of multiple clients talking to us at the same time. Other questions? All right, let's look at the code version of this. So I have VS Code connected to Mantis here. And uh, I am going to uh, use the set of wrapper functions from uh, the textbook, which basically make a system call, check whether it returned an error or not, and stop the program if it returned an error. So it's kind of a, a way where I'm not going to have to kind of write all the error checking myself. And the client uh, will do the following. I'll just start off declaring some variables that I'm going to need. Where I'm going to have an integer for a file descriptor, a buffer of characters that has, that I'll use a macro to define the length of 1024. Um, and 
I'm also going to show how we use that robust I, those robust I/O functions, which um, are more reliable for communicating over over a socket than the the C library ones. And so the first thing that I will do uh, for the client is to open up a the client socket and I'll use that localhost address and I'll use port 8000 just to choose kind of an arbitrary port could be uh, uh, any could choose any port that the system is not currently using for something else pretty sure 8000 will be available so uh, this is just from the client side opening up that that socket uh, and then I will if I want to use this uh, if I want to do buffered reading with these robust IO functions the first thing that I do is initialize this Rio read init B for buffered and I give it the this Rio T struct which is going to have all the information that it keep that it needs to kind of keep track of the buffer and where it is in, in the file and whatnot. And give it the file descriptor. So now I can use this Rio struct to do buffered reading on this file, which will be, be useful. Uh, and then comes the meat of the program, which is pretty straightforward. I'm going to get user input using fget store it in the buffer up to max line bytes from standard in. So just going to keep reading uh, user input from the terminal. Um, and as long as fgets doesn't return null, it was able to read uh, more input. And then I'm just going to write uh, the bytes of that input across the socket to that I have connected to the server. So I will write on the client file descriptor the contents of buffer, and I will write sterlin of buffer bytes. Why would I tell, tell this function to write sterlin of the buffer bytes rather than write max line bytes? Charlie? Uh, well, max line is the size of the buffer. So uh, either way, I'm making sure I'm not writing more bytes than, than are in the buffer. Why? Will it take into account the alternator? Uh, Sterlin will. Max line will not. So that's the key here. If I, I have 1,024 bytes in this buffer, this F gets read in kind of one line of input from the terminal up to 1,024 characters. So maybe it's just the word hello. And so if I, but if I put max line here, it would write all 1,024 bytes of the buffer instead of only up to the null terminator, which will write a bunch of uninitialized bytes across the network and the behavior of this program would be pretty weird. Make sense? Other questions so far? What is the real T struct? Like, what does it actually store? Uh, so this is also in the notes, but it uh, stores um, uh, it stores like the it, it's the things we talked about for the buffered read. It needs to like what position is it in the file? How many of the bytes in the buffer are already read? How big is the buffer? Um, a pointer to the underlying file. Um, all right. So once we have, uh, as befits an echo, once we have sent our message across the socket, we're then just going to uh, read the reply, Rio read line B. So do a buffered read of one line of the reply. We give it a pointer to this Rio struct, tell it to store what it's reading in the buffer, and again, read up to max line bytes, but it's going to stop if it sees a null terminator or a new line. All right, once we are done with this loop, once we, uh, once there's no more user input to read, 
we will close our socket and exit the process. So um, when you are like doing like the, the uh, buffer for writing and, and reading, you're using the same place. Yeah, exactly. So that I fill the buffer with stuff I get from the user, then I send the con write the contents of that buffer that has the user input to the socket that gets sent to the server. Now that I've sent that, I don't need that data around anymore. There's nothing else I'm going to do with it, so then I can use the, um, uh, use the buffer um, uh, that same buffer to store whatever I get back from the server. And the one thing that I forgot was to just send the contents of the buffer to standard out so I can see what I got back from the server. Angela? Can you explain again? So if I want to, this is to initialize the data, the, this data structure that's going to keep track of uh, the data I need to do the buffered read. So I've declared this uh, ReoT, this struct that has kind of current position in the file and current position in the buffer and uh, whatever else. Uh, and so I initialize it to be able to read from this file descriptor. And I just need to do that once, and then I can start doing using the buffered read functions. Other questions? All right. Um, I understand like where the like how the, the, the stuff in the buffer is getting to the server. Like where is that happening? Uh, so that is this write here. Because uh, when we write to the file descriptor for the socket, that's the nice thing about the sockets being files is that just like we can write bytes to some file that's stored in our, on our disk, we can write bytes to a socket and they're sent to whatever the other end of that socket is. And in this case, it's connected to some socket in the echo server. So you don't even know what the port of the server is? Uh, I have hard coded the port to be 8000. That's kind of our known port for what the echo server is gonna be listening on. Wait, so then what's the client? Uh, the client port will be a random one assigned by the operating system kernel, uh, and that's because we, in order to connect to the server, we need to know exactly what port that is. But on the client side, it just needs any port will do. Like the server doesn't have to know ahead of time what port the client's going to be on. So we can let that one be sort of assigned at the moment that we create the socket. And and we'll we'll see in a moment. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna print out the port that the, the client is on. So okay, so I'm because I'm kind of confused why you wrote as the client file descriptor instead of like the server file descriptor. Ah, so client file descriptor meaning uh, this is the file descriptor the client is using to send stuff to the server. Uh, yeah, it it is yeah the it's the file descriptor like in the client's process that it's using to send stuff to the server. All right, so let's look at the, the server side of things. Uh, just to save some time um, and to avoid, avoid some gory details, there's kind of some boilerplate here that's involved in setting up this listening socket that I, I talked about. So I just want to highlight uh, the, a few important things. Uh, we use this open listenfd to create a listening socket, and it's going to use a command line argument. So when I run the server process, I'm going to put on the command line what port it should use. Uh, and this accept function is what actually accepts a connection from the client and creates that dedicated socket for communicating with the client, which is this confd. And then it's going to call this echo function with that file descriptor. So let's look at what this echo function would be. takes the connection file descriptor and declares some variables I'm going to need. A size T, it will need its own buffer and 
I might usually have a header file that has this max line, but I'll just define it in both of these files. And we'll also have a Rio struct for the server side. And the server side is going to look very similar in that it's just going to be reading from the client and echoing it back. So we'll need our Rio init read B to initialize this uh, Rio, uh, Rio struct to read on the uh, connection file descriptor. And then here, I'm going to call Rio read, uh, read line B and say use that struct, use this buffer up to, up to max line characters. Uh, and something useful is that, I guess, when we have talked about the read uh, system call to read from a file, does anyone remember what that function returns? So when we open a file, we, it returns the file descriptor. When we read, it's going to return how many bytes we read. So if it, for example, was not able to read or there was nothing to read, it would return zero. And that's going to be useful here because one, we're going to want to save in a variable n how many bytes were read. And we only want to continue reading as long as there is something to read. So if we ever call this read line and it returns zero, then it wasn't able to read anything and we're and we're done. There's no more no more input. So as long as we were able to read some number of bytes and put it into the buffer, then we'll print out a message so we can see what's going on. Server received. Uh, percent ld bytes, give it n, uh, and then in our simple echo server, we're just going to immediately write that back to the client. We're just sort of echoing the same messages back and forth. Send on the connection file descriptor from the buffer n bytes. Questions on this? Okay, so Rio right end, so that is sending over that connection the contents of the buffer that we just read. Uh, up uh, exactly n bytes from the of the, the it's sending the first n bytes of the buffer. Okay. So Rio read line B and Rio right end are kind of two different like read and write operations in the same connection. Yes, so we're, we're uh, and this is a useful property of sockets, is that they are two-way, or duplex, as it's sometimes said. We can get input over the socket, and then send a response back over that same socket. All right, I'm going to save these files, and then bring up a terminal. Well, make, which I messed up the make file. Interesting. Init read. Oh, it's read init. That's why. Made up the name of the function. Okay, so I will start the echo server listening at port 8000, and nothing is happening because it's just sitting there listening. It hasn't gotten any connections yet. And if I want to start the client to connect to it, I actually need to do that in a separate terminal because this terminal is sitting here running the server. So in VS Code, there's this little plus in the upper right corner of the terminal, 
can click that, it opens a new terminal, and now I have kind of both terminals that I can flip back and forth over here on the right. So in this one, I'm going to start the Echo client. So I go back to the Echo server. It says it's received a connection from localhost, from this client process, on this, and the client's using this randomly assigned port, 42,046. And then on the client, I can type some input and hit enter. The server received 17 bytes, received that string that I just typed in, and it sent it back to the client, whereupon the client printed it out. And so I could just keep echoing things back and forth, a bunch of A's, and I can see it kept receiving two bytes, two bytes, two bytes. Why, when I typed A, is it two bytes instead of one? Exactly. It's the null terminator. We have the A, and then we have the null terminator after that. Um, all right. Does this make sense? Questions on how these two processes are reading and writing back and forth? All right. So this uh, code for this echo server, uh, along with uh, some other example code that comes with Lab 5, the, the tiny web server. Uh, these will be good places to look as you're doing Lab 5 uh, for examples of how to read and write uh, uh, messages over a socket. All right. So uh, it's now time for uh, the first major drought in U.S. history. Uh, this happened in the 1930s, um, uh, called the Dust Bowl. Uh, and here is a, a, a picture of a, a, a farmer and, and two of his children in a, a walking during a, a dust storm. Uh, and this uh, affected the region shown here, sort of was uh, the drought was worst at the kind of intersection of Kansas, Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, and Oklahoma, uh, but covered a fairly large region. Um, and there was tremendous soil erosion and no rain um, and massive dust storms blowing in. Um, uh, here's a, another uh, ominous picture of a dust storm. Uh, and it would just bury things in, uh, in dust uh, and uh, the people who kind of were living and farming this area uh, really often had no choice but to kind of pack whatever they could fit in whatever vehicle they had and try and head out, often uh, west, to, to try and find better opportunities. Um, and this uh, terrible drought uh, and um, kind of environmental uh, set of problems coincided with uh, the worst economic catastrophe in the uh, uh, country's history. So this is during the, the Great Depression, which um, had uh, uh, kicked off with a stock market crash in 1929. And so here's uh, a line of, of unemployed uh, uh, men waiting for, for food in Chicago. Uh, and this is uh, one of these kind of makeshift uh, 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 little uh, villages in New York City, which uh, and after Herbert Hoover, who was president at the time, these got called Hoovervilles, as people blamed uh, Hoover for, uh, for the economic mess. All right. Now let's talk about HTTP. So uh, when clients and servers send information back and forth, they have to have some agreed upon system of how to communicate what the client wants and how should the server format and communicate whatever response the client is looking for. Um, 
so uh, particularly for, uh, for websites, the kind of protocol, the, the standard describing how these messages should be formatted and structured is the hypertext transfer protocol, or HTTP. Um, this uh, is why you often see web addresses beginning with HTTP colon slash slash. They're beginning with a prefix of this is the protocol that should be used to kind of, uh, access, access this resource. And uh, the basic form is we have some web client, which is often a web browser, but doesn't have to be. And it's going to send an HTTP request to a web server, which is going to send an HTTP response, which will hopefully include the content that the client is requesting. Um, and so the uh, this request and response take on a particular structure. So for example, that the server can tell and kind of break down uh, the request and tell exactly what the client is looking for. Uh, and so the uh, our request It begins with a special line called the request line, uh, which includes the method, which is there are different kinds of requests, and the method specifies which kind of request uh, uh, the client is looking for. We're only going to focus on one method, which is the get method, which is just I want some web page or some image or some particular resource. But there's other methods where the client is, say, say you filled in a form on a web page and you hit submit. There are other kinds of methods, uh, particularly one called post, which is like sending the content of that form to the server. But we're just going to focus on where the client is just asking for a web page or something like that. So we have the method. Then we have the URL, and then we have the version. And the version here is because HTTP has different versions. There are different kind of standards that uh, basically have gotten more complex and sophisticated over time. Uh, and so there's uh, this version. Like Git, we're going to focus on the kind of basic HTTP 1.0, uh, but you'll also see 1.1 as well as 2, and then the latest standard, which is, um, well, I don't think it uh, is, yeah, it's reasonably well adopted at this point, HTTP 3, but we're, we're focusing on the kind of uh, most basic um, version of this, which and gets at the, the core ideas that we're interested in. And so the URL is uh, a string that kind of specifies what uh, the client is actually looking for. And so this URL uh, would be something like HTTP colon slash slash edu. colon 80 slash index dot html. And this URL has kind of several different pieces to it. Uh, we have the 
a protocol in this HTTP uh, colon here. Uh, we then have carlton.edu, which is the name of the host, the name of the server that we're trying to, that we're requesting uh, uh, a resource from. We have this port, which is specified, which is separated from the host name by a colon. And then this last part, Uh, is the resource or um, uh, uh, you might say the, the file name, but kind of whatever specific thing uh, the client is requesting from this host. You but you know, like you know, nowadays when we enter like a host name in the browser, we don't really enter into a specified port. Yes. So so this colon eighty is r redundant because port 80 is the default HTTP port. But if you wanted to request from Carlton EDU at some other than the default port, then you could fill in 80 with a different number. Uh, if you don't put this colon 80, it will just be assumed to be 80. Um, and you often don't see this index.html, uh, because for many hosts, if you just Kind of request something from the host name with no resource specified, it will send you back some default website, which is often a file called index.html. But you could, uh, there's all sorts of, kind of any particular file or, that you want from the host, you would fill that in kind of after the port. Other questions at this point? All right, so number one, we have this request, uh, this request line. Uh, next, we have request headers, uh, of which there are zero or more. So there might not be any request headers. Uh, but when it comes to um, the headers, they'll be of the form header name. colon header value. Uh, and the purpose of these is to provide additional information to the server. So uh, this would be something like you could tell it uh, to keep this connection active because it should expect more requests from you. Or you could tell it to close the connection as soon as it responds. Um, uh, and they're, depending on the HTTP version, the, particularly the newer ones support a much broader range of headers and many more different things you can uh, uh, pass along to, to the server. Uh, and then the request is terminated by a blank line. So the way that the server knows that it, is, it has received the entirety of the request is that it reads a blank line. And here's uh, an annoying detail. The blank line, um, we might think that a blank line is just our kind of backslash n, our new line. But in HTTP, every line ends with the carriage return new line. So each one, the request line ends with these two characters and then a null terminator. The request headers all do, and the blank line consists of this carriage return and then new line. And so the server won't think that it's seen the end of the request until it sees a line that consists of exactly this. 
Wait, um, didn't you say every line is terminated by the chemistry? Yes. So every line is terminated by those, and the blank line is a line that has just this uh, and nothing else. Okay. All right. So that's the request side. For the response, as a very similar structure, we have a response line, which consists of the version, the status, and the message. And uh, the status and the message are to communicate, basically, did this request succeed, or was there some problem? So what we're hoping to see is that the status code is 200 and that the message is OK. This means the request succeeded. You should expect the response to follow immediately. Um, if you uh, are making a request for something that you are not allowed to access, anyone know what the status for that is, Charlie? Yes, that is 404, and the message will say something about forbidden, or you do not have permission to access this resource. Uh, there is messages, there's responses that tell you this resource has moved to a different location, um, or other problems with the request are communicated in this first line. Oh. Out of curiosity, why the number? Like, what does it mean? Uh, that's a good question. I do not know where the numbers come from. Uh, Either historical nonsense or there's a good reason, but I can't tell you which those are. Other questions? All right, rest of the request is are the response headers. Uh, and there are two very important headers that uh, I will, will highlight. One is the content height type header, and the other is the content length header. So the content type is the server telling the client what type of data, what type of file it's sending back. So this could be something like text slash HTML if it's sending a web page back, or it could be uh, something like image slash PNG to tell it I'm sending a PNG image back. Uh, these things uh, these like specific strings, text slash HTML, image slash PNG, these are called MIME types, M-I-M-E. Um, MIME is uh, it's um, I forget what it stands for, uh, but it's an, an acronym for these like different specific strings that indicate different types of media um, that you send back. There's ones for PDFs and videos and different kinds of images, or if you're sending code or kind of all sorts of things. Yeah. So why isn't the header called my type? Why is it called content type? There's like another name to call those types. Um, oh, you're saying this? It would make more sense if this was my type. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but so yeah, we should we should write a letter to the HTTP people, <laughs> let them know. Um, yeah, I guess this is like HTTP was like it's a sort of separate uh, standard from this MIME standard, so they aren't like exactly the same thing. So I think this content type is more general. But in practice, kind of, it's it's usually filled in by these maybe mind types. Five. Yeah. 
So with the response headers, is is it either content height or content length, or is that on the same line? Uh, each header is a separate line, and there are many different kinds of headers, but you would expect to always see these two. Um, the content length, I mean, the, the content type is sort of, can be useful, but the content length is essential. Um, so it's just going to be some number, like uh, maybe 124 or um, kind of whatever, whatever number, and this, and this tells the client how many bytes it should expect, because the, what follows after the headers and um, is a blank line, and then finally the content. Excuse me. Oh, then why would you need like that sort of like and if you just read whatever, like you know, it makes a sense here? Uh, that's a great question. How would we know when to stop reading? No, but like you get how much information you, you, you receive, right? Uh, um, all of those gonna be useful for you, or you're sending some redundant like data to the server? Right? Yeah. So is it? It's important to like the important fact is that we are receiving this over uh, a network, and that network is going to transmit data at a certain rate. And a certain number of bytes per second is going to be sent over that. Um, and particularly if that network is Wi-Fi, there could be interference with those radio signals. So there might be some delay while sort of everything gets resent if something was lost. And so it means that we don't necessarily receive all of the content all at once. We're just kind of reading it in one byte at a time as it arrives. And so we need some way to know when to stop waiting for more content to arrive. Otherwise, we just wait forever. Uh, and maybe the content is over, but we have no way of knowing that. Uh, is that where you use like send or file? Um, so one issue is that we want this content to be able to include literally anything. And so we don't want it to be a case that there is some specific pattern of bytes that we reserve as signaling the end of the content, because we there might be some content that should just include that pattern of bytes normally. And so instead, the server just tells the client, read exactly this many bytes of content, and then stop. And so without knowing exactly how many bytes of read, we're sort of in a bit of a pickle. But that's why the content length header uh, is very necessary. Does that make sense? Questions on this? All right, let's do some practice. Because this content might include blank lines as a normal part of the content. All right, so what is an important benefit of modeling sockets as files? All right, move towards C, that's excellent. This is a really nice fact about modeling sockets as, as files. Uh, any questions on this one? All right, let's do a bit of review on, sorry, is there a question? Yeah, no, I, I was just going to ask if the others were like not benefits of it, or if they were just not as important. Um, 
I would say modeling sockets as files versus some alternate solution, I can definitely say C is a benefit. Without n assuming things about that alternate solution, I don't think I can say anything about B or D. All right, so I have some steps here related to uh, communication over HTTP. And uh, I want you to think about what order do these steps uh, need to occur in. All right, we have some votes for all four, so please discuss with your neighbors kind of why you think the order you chose is correct. All right. Lots of votes for D. That's excellent. Will uh, uh, someone share how you thought about what order these needed to go in? Angela? Um, in order for anything to start, the server has to be listening and open to responses, so you don't see the whole server. Um, and then to initiate a request, it also has to open the socket. Mm -hmm. So the D means that the client is like connecting to the port on the server. That's right. Okay. Um, and then, oh yeah, the request comes before the headers, because the headers are additional, and then you can respond after receiving the response. Exactly. Uh, Rebecca? So, just to clarify, the port X here is what we were calling port P earlier? Yes, that's my bad. The X here is the known ahead of time port that the server is listening on, which I called P before. That's my bad. Any other questions? All right, so I'm going to use our last few minutes to talk about Lab 5. So um, in Lab 5, you are implementing what is called a proxy server, which means that when we had our client and server before, they were sending messages directly back and forth. Uh, but what you are implementing is sort of a, uh, a server in the middle where now the client will send its request to the proxy and the proxy will forward that request onto the server. The server will respond and then the proxy will send the response to the client. So there are a few reasons why you would want to kind of have this extra step in the middle here. Uh, one that you will implement in part of the lab is caching, meaning that if the client, uh, if one client requests some website and then some other client requests that same website, the proxy might have stored in its memory what it got back for the first request and doesn't even need to talk to the server a second time. It can just immediately reply with the data from its cache. Um, there are also security slash anonymity reasons why you might want to connect through a proxy rather than directly uh, to the server. Um, and so there are, the first part of the lab is implementing uh, something similar to the echo server that I just demoed where the proxy is just going to like read an HTTP but with the HTTP request and response structure that uh, uh, we went over today, the proxy will read an HTTP request from the client and just send that along to the server. But it will, to know what server it connects to, it will need to use the URL in that request line from the client because it needs to open a socket to whatever server the client's trying to talk to. And then the server will send some response which the proxy just writes back to the client. Uh, the starter code that I'm providing has the code that I sort of provides the code that I glossed over today about having the server start listening for connections. And you are implementing the function that does the kind of reading and writing back and forth for this HTTP request and response. Um, for part two, you'll add a cache to the proxy where when it gets something back from the server, it's just going to copy that into its own memory. Um, to retrieve if it gets the same request later. Uh, and 
The third part is actually quite simple, but you'll make it so the proxy can handle multiple connections at the same time. And uh, we didn't have time for it today, so on Wednesday we'll cover both concurrency and parallelism and talk about uh, methods of doing that. Um, and part four is new, uh, is a, a new kind of thing I'm asking you to do for this lab, uh, which is the auto grader that uh, is provided with the lab is very simple. It checks, um, and by simple I just mean it doesn't, ch it checks almost no edge cases. The cases it does check are very straightforward. Uh, and so for part four, I am challenging you to come up with additional test cases um, that the auto grader does not cover. And there's a, a, a grading scheme, which you can see in the write-up, where the more you can automate your test cases, the more points they will earn. So uh, please get started on that. Uh, the, uh, this week's quiz is out on Moodle. I have office hours in the lab tomorrow night, and I will see you Wednesday.